You're welcome back. I was not missing in action. I was <laughs> right here all the time. But, uh, you know, today is the week for the ladies. Uh, by the way, uh, we, we had Men's Day during the weekend. Mm. It's unfortunate that the same day that men are being celebrated, the only day that men are being celebrated is also World Toilet Day. And <laughs> it's okay. terrible. And a lot of people watching us here now, women who are watching us, did mm. not even remember that they should say congratulations or happy Men's Day to what, us. What but we go still survive. That, what any, kind of women do you have in your any, life? Anyhow, yes. anyhow. Like you, you didn't say anything. Well, like, it, like well, happy Men's well, Day. Well, I wish the, a happy International Men's Day to the in men area. in my life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, we did tell you that we're going to be talking about the uh, state of the nation, as it were, and we have someone who is joining us here right now. Barista, good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, there was the, the, the conversation we're about to start having stemmed up from uh, a, a statement that was made by the former governor of Cross River State, uh, Governor Donald Duke, where he said that no political party can save Nigeria. Do you agree to this statement? How do you react to it? Well, um, my, my reaction is that um, political parties are vehicles for aspiration to political power. And therefore, the political parties do not in themselves guarantee that a state will be good or will be well run, as it were. It is the individuals, the individual candidates that are running on the platform of these political parties that will bring their competence and uh, capacity to the governance process. And so it is the individuals that we look up to. And it is the individuals who should talk and tell us about the programs that they intend to implement using the party platform to pull back Nigeria from uh, this grim and bitter moment that we appear to be in to a better society that God blessed with plenty of mineral and human resources. I think that is the individual that will give hope to the Nigerian people about the deteriorating uh, security situation, the economic hardship, and so on. How to tackle it is indeed uh, squarely placed on the individual, not the party. Although the party is a platform, so could that individual ascend to power. But, but parties have, have some kind of ideology in the party, and if you want to come out with a manifesto as an aspirant or as a candidate of any party, it has to align also with the kind of uh, ideology of the party. So how can an individual make an impact when the party uh, might be having an ideology that is different from what he has in mind to do? Will the influence of the party not bear him down in such a way that he cannot succeed, if, even if he has good intentions for the country? Now, unfortunately, our parties in Nigeria are not entirely are not uh, necessarily based on uh, ideologies. If you look at uh, you know the major parties, what is really the ideology? You know, they are basically populist parties that talk about uh, making Nigeria a better place. That is basically what all the politicians are saying. And if you do a study of their manifesto, you really do not see much of uh, a difference is it's, it's what you can describe as um, you know uh, 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 distinction uh, a difference without distinction as it were because they are basically saying the same thing you know and they are basically giving populist ideas about how to make nigeria greater you know our politicians don't really join political parties based on ideology otherwise you won't find them moving from one political party to another what they are moving for is to grant them um, opportunity of um, actualizing their political interest and perhaps now showcasing their personal competences using the political party as a platform. That is precisely what happens in Nigeria, unlike perhaps in other clients, where parties are known for their ideologies and are identified with such ideologies. And hardly do people move from one political party to the other. So we don't have such clear divides in Nigeria 
And so what happens in Nigeria is that the individuals seek for accommodation to find a platform uh, to seek to ascend to power. And uh, that has not uh, really changed. All right. Uh, part of the point that Donald Duke made while he was talking over the weekend is uh, judicial reforms. According to him, and I quote, the only hope that we can have is judicial reforms. He says judicial reforms is more pertinent than political reforms. How do you react to this part of the statement? Well, uh, there is need for um, the judiciary and the court system to be seen as a last, as I uh, will popularly say, the last hope of the common man. You see, Section 6 of our Constitution vests the judicial powers of the Nigerian state in the courts. And so that is a formal option that will go to um, seek resolution of justiciable matters. However, um, the judiciary itself does not appear to be totally uh, insulated from the entire society. You find that in the appointment process of judicial officers, a lot of influence gets to come in from the executive. So precisely, um, the executive branch also, to a great extent, you know, influences who becomes appointed as a judge. And when they get in, you know, it now depends on the individual and individual commitment to be able to resist, you know, subtle pressures real or imagined from the executive branch. As we can see in some of the political decisions uh, in recent times in Nigeria, take the Imo State case, for, for example, it has continued to generate a lot of, um, a lot of uh, controversy, you know, and uh, people tend to resonate with the dissenting opinion of Justice C.C. Imo's of the Supreme Court in that case. Because um, it was quite surprising that somebody who came a distant force was uh, now declared as the winner of the election. And it throws up the problem of legitimacy. And I'm sure if you go to email state, that problem still persists. So really, the, the judiciary can help. But there's a limit to which the judiciary can be used uh, to solve political questions. You can't impose you know, um, the judicial solutions or legal solutions to political questions. I personally do not believe that the judiciary or the court system should supplant the powers of the citizens to choose their leaders. So for the judiciary uh, to continue to resolve those issues and then to impose uh, whoever in their opinion should now become uh, the political office holder in uh, whether it's the state or the nation or the parliament or whatever is itself uh, also a problem. It's a, it negatives uh, those uh, genuine aspects of democracy. So the judiciary is, is good. You know, once they maintain their independence and are autonomous and are properly funded, then the judiciary can really flourish as it flourishes in other places. In the UK, for instance, during the world wars, I mean the wars, the courts were enforcing the laws because they believe the law never changes. The law is just there until it is changed by the lawgiver. So in cases like uh, Liver Siege and Anderson, one of the greatest legal minds, I would call Lord Etkin, said that whatever the circumstance, even in times of war, even in times of crisis, that the law speaks the same language and that the judges are committed to interpreting the law as it is and giving effect to that law. Can we have it in Nigeria? Do we have such bold spirits in Nigeria? Well, there are some, uh, but definitely with the increasing executive interference in the processes of appointment of judicial officers, you hardly can see um, that kind of development because they will also take into cognizance that they also got to where they are through the instrumentality of people in power. So it's unfortunate that that is the reality of the situation. Okay, but apart from the autonomy that you're seeking for the judiciary and so many other things that you want to be put in place, it has also been argued that even the judicial system is fraught with a lot of people who are really, really corrupt. Like now, justice is for the highest bidder. So do you, do you agree with this kind of assessment of the judicial system where lawyers get bought to give judgments to the people that give them the highest money on so many other things? Do you attribute that to anything that 
comes from the influence of the executive or the society or anything. What's your reaction? Well, my reaction is that, um, you know, there is no established case yet uh, of uh, a judicial officer who has been bribed with uh, plenty of money to give judgment one way or the other. I am not too sure that the judicial officer has been convicted of uh, collecting a lot of money to pervert the course of justice. But I am only saying that they are also human beings and they are appointed through a process. And that, that process of appointment is being um, over-interfered with by the executive branch. And so long as the executive continues to interfere, so long would they want to also interfere in the outcome of uh, judicial decisions. And that would not be good for a society like ours. That is on the one side. Uh, on the other hand, is also that many decisions of courts that come out against the governments in power have not been given effect because the government are reluctant to enforce such judgments. A lot of decisions are gotten against the police, for instance, for human rights violations. But hardly do they obey um, those judgments and pay damages that um, are imposed on them by the Constitution by way of protecting the fundamental rights of citizens and preventing the uh, a infraction of those rights. So that is the problem that we have. It is the level of um, our political development and the judicial and the uh, democratic space. Otherwise, in more advanced clients, you know, the police will not need to be told to enforce the judgment. Once it is given, it is taken as a matter of course that it will be obeyed and it has to be obeyed. But in Nigeria, that does not appear to be uh, the case. Let me give you a recent instance. Take the recent instance of the decision of the court with respect to the ASU problem. You know, the government insisted they must go back to work. And incidentally, the court agreed and said the, law, the, the lecturers should go back to work. And then they can appeal later. Great. But the Nigerian citizen also, uh, Nambi Kano, was given, a judgment was given for him. And that was not obeyed by the same government. And rather, they are going to oppose it, not even obeying the order of the court, like setting him free and then appealing against it, as it were. So that is, um, such things, uh, you know, really happen. And, um, you know, I, I, I believe that our judges will uh, sit up to ensure that justice is done to all manner of men, no matter whose ox is God. But then, they, they, because they cannot enforce those decisions, the government itself has a lot of responsibility, at least to give the Nigerian nation a very good image, that people will say, yes, you are good, and we can enter into business contracts with people from Nigeria, we can enter into business contracts in Nigeria with the hope that the courts will always interpret contracts, and that once a decision is given, that it will uh, be implemented. But when people have this impression, Let me ask you this question, Nigeria Minister. is uh, can you hear me? not a, uh, Marissa, can you hear me? A, a problem. Yes, please. Yes, uh, you, uh, because we're rounding off now so quickly. Uh, you've mentioned judicial independence. Uh, what are the other areas in the judiciary that you would say really needs to be reformed, you know, to achieve uh, all these positive areas that you, would have, that you would love to see in the judiciary, but things need to be done in, a, in order to achieve these changes? What are the things you would want to see put in place to achieve these things? Well, first of all, we must uh, get it right at the level of... Uh, those we admit to the Nigerian bar, that's one. And secondly, the process of appointment into the judicial positions, that's important. So that it will be people who have passed through the crucibles that will uh, be given opportunity of being appointed. And uh, people, of course, that have passed through such tests will be taken to be people who have integrity, who will, against all odds, stand their ground and say, they must do that. Look at our judiciary, you know. Um, from the era of the uh, Shaws, the Aniagolus, the Uputas, uh, the Alatauras, and so on, the Mekagos, do we still have 
you know, sort of caliber. We, 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 you know, it's not that they are not there, but it's just that enormous influence has come upon uh, the judiciary. And I think that if they are insulated from such pressures by giving them independence, by reducing political influence in the appointment of judicial officers, then we can begin to make a move to having an uh, impeccable judiciary. All right. Uh, this is where we end this, you know, segment of the program. Uh, Barrister Chijioke Abo, thank you so much for your contributions to the run-up this morning. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming by. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. All right. Uh, the run-up continues. Yangu. Yeah, he made a very um, salient point there when he said that... Um, uh, it's the enforcement of these laws, of these things that uh, really, really matter. Sometimes mm. they are court judgments and the people who should enforce them are not enforcing. Even the government itself is not obeying this law. This morning, while coming to work, uh, somewhere at uh, Deniji, they call it or so, just at, uh, when you're entering the third mainland bridge from the island here, I saw a policeman in uniform, this um, mobile policeman, he just dropped a passenger and was, was paid on a bike. And then immediately another one, some, somebody else in suit who was maybe running late, was now like, <laughs> can you take me as well? He stood there and they were bidding the price. And he's in uniform. And he's in uniform. Wow. The same bike that they have stopped in Lagos, the policemen that are supposed to enforce the law are the ones now making riding the money, bikes. riding the bikes and carrying passengers. The same bikes without helmets or any other safety precautions and all that. So hmm. enforcement of the law or making the laws and feeling that someone else should obey it and not you is really the bane of the, the boon of this uh, society, this so country. So how do we that get we, it right? How do we get it right? <laughs> because if I break the law, I'm expecting the policeman to, to, to reprimand me, to catch me, to so arrest me. The now police? the policeman is the one breaking the law. <laughs> who will now arrest him? Me? Funny. Because... Next thing, he's a gunslinging person. There's a gun in front of him and mm. there's a passenger behind him. So how do I even talk to this man because I don't know if he's just coming from a pub or something. Mm. It's a difficult thing. And until we get to the point where everybody carries their responsibility the way they should, we will find it difficult in this country. All right, we'll take a quick break. When we return, uh, we will be having another guest join us to talk about funding in the entertainment industry. Do not go anywhere. The run-up will be back. Stay with us. <laughs>